Jewelry World Clinicians, and welcome to another case review. I'm happy to be joined today by Dr. Rico Short, board certified in Adonis and private practice at Apex and Adonis in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Short is also a clinical assistant professor at the Medical College of Georgia School of Dentistry and is also the author of several publications, uh, books, and uh, scientific publications. Dr. Short, uh, if I may call you Rico, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, my pleasure, Alan. Good having you. Now, you had a case that I wanted to share with our audience here, and that's which I found very interesting. So I'm going to just introduce the case and ask you a few questions about it. This is a case of a seven-year-old patient who came to see you with a, uh, with a chief complaint of spontaneous pain and discomfort in a mandibular first molar, the left mandibular first molar. Can you give us a little bit of a background about this patient? Yes. Um, the kid came in. Um, he was in a lot of pain, and the... Um, the general dentist, he didn't understand why he was in a lot of pain because he said the restoration was very shallow. Um, and you can look at the radiograph and the restoration does not look that deep. But if you look really closely on kids, they have a very high, <clears throat> excuse me, pulp horn. So that mesial pulp horn actually extends up um, pretty close um, underneath that, uh, that restoration there. And so um, that, that, I think, was causing the patient the, uh, the symptoms there. So it's interesting because I see this. I mean, this obviously is a very young patient, a seven-year-old patient. So being a first molar, the tooth erupted into the mouth when the patient was six years old. So we have incomplete root formation. But even in adults, uh, Rico, I have seen in, a, in young adults uh, in their 20s and so on, this issue of a very long, elongated and projecting pulp horn tends to be a problem that occurs you know, fairly commonly where these patients end up suffering sensitivity and discomfort following even shallow composite or any other kind of restoration. Have you experienced that too clinically? Absolutely. Um, I see that a lot. And in fact, a lot of the dentists are in denial. They say, hey, you know, my restoration is very shallow and I don't, I don't understand why this patient is having all these issues. And, and I try to explain that to the patient as well because the patient is upset. They said they had no pain. Uh, they went in and get a shallow filling, and now all of a sudden they got to get a root canal, and they want to blame their dentist for something that they think the dentist did wrong or they went too deep. And I have to explain to them that you know um, the pulp um, anatomy is different on every patient. Um, you can do a very shallow restoration, but if you have a high a pulp horn or a pulpal anatomy complicated on top of the fact that you're a grinder, you could have a micro crack as well. You can have um, some very very severe symptoms and uh, which may lead to having a root canal. So, so it's very important and very stressed uh, to the dentist that these things happen um, and, and, it, and, it, and it may be totally out of your control. You do everything right. You, you, you put your restoration down. You base it up. You do everything. But you know, we always have to remember um, we have a, a, a person attached to this tooth and there's different anatomies in, in every individual and in every tooth. You're absolutely right. I mean, the mechanisms of uh, sensitivity postoperatively, uh, dental sensitivity, is fairly complex and is probably the subject of a whole tutorial itself. Uh, but uh, in patients like this, it's very important to educate them, you know, probably preoperatively when you have a patient with a very long pulp horn, to let them know that sometimes there could, there could be some sensitivity as a result of that. But in this particular case, my understanding was that there was also a, 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 an amalgam that was broken, there was a filling was broken, and there was some secondary caries underneath there, correct? That's correct. On, on this particular case, um, the amalgam was broken and there was some caries underneath the amalgam. So how did you test? You, you did your pulpal vitality test, I would assume, obviously. As a, what was your diagnosis at this point for this patient? Um, my pulpal diagnosis was acute irreversible pulpitis. Um, I put cold on the tooth. I mean, of course, obviously, the kid didn't like that. Um, he, was, he, was, he was already in pain. I put cold on it. And the reason why I had to do that, I wanted to make sure the pulp was still vital because that determines the type of treatment I would have to do. Because if it was non-vital, then we know apexogenesis won't work because we know we need vital pulp tissue in order for the apexogenesis to work. And if it was non-vital, and then we would have a whole different set of problems on our hands. I think I heard you say that it was irreversible. So you meant to say reversible pulpitis. So it was reversible pulpitis, which is why you decided to do apexogenesis, correct? I guess technically you can call it reversible pulpitis. Um, you know, the way I look at reversible pulpitis is um, you have a you have a pulpitis, an inflamed pulp, and you are able to do a a, a procedure um, not involving the pulp, um, like basically do another do a restoration or or take the occlusion down or what have you, in order to um, 
um, you know, not enter the pulp. But I do understand some people still call it uh, reversible pulpitis in the event of something like like this case where yeah. they're doing a pulp cap. So. Yeah, I think that deadline is um, uh, is a little bit blurred. Uh, possibly you can call uh, call it, uh, you know, symptomatic reversible pulpitis. In which case, a normal periapex. Obviously, we always want to have a pulp on an apical diagnosis, uh, and or as you prefer to call it, I guess, irreversible. Uh, but either way, you decided that you were going to go ahead and do a. Uh, uh, apexogenesis, which is obviously the right decision here because you have incomplete root formation and it's very important that the root formation be complete. You know, interestingly, a lot of times people look at the apices of these teeth and they see those radiolucencies and mistake them for, you know, periapical radiolucencies due to pathosis, whereas those are actually just physiological processes by which uh, root formation is being complete, correct? That is correct. And that's, that's why it's really important that um, you understand anatomy and you understand, like you mentioned before, that this tooth usually erupts at age six. And according to most of the studies, it takes about three years for the apex to completely close. So this kid is under nine years old. So, you know, this is something that's fairly common. Now, if this kid was 10 years old, 11 years old, and had had an open neck apex like that, and then we probably are looking at um, a, a necrotic pulp and an incomplete apex, but but there probably won't be vitality there. Yeah, exactly. And as you can see, also the second molar behind uh, this tooth is uh, clearly has uh, you know <laughs> the, the root being formed as well uh, for proper eruption, probably around the age of uh, you know uh, I guess what uh, twelve or something like that. Uh, anyway, right. so so you go ahead, you went ahead and did your caries removal in this case, correct? And I think you ended up uh, getting uh, just getting a little bit of a pulpal exposure there after removal all the caries, the secondary caries that were underneath the uh, this broken filling, and then you repaired it using MTA. And then what did you put on top of it? Well, when I when I opened the tooth up, um, the tooth was quite quite hemorrhagic. So I actually rinsed it with 3% um, sodium hypochlorite or half strength sodium hypochlorite, mixed it with uh, distilled water. And then um, I came back and rinsed it with saline. And after that, I used some 2% 2 chlorhexidine um, just to make sure we, we try to maximize the antimicrobial environment in that area. And then uh, once I did that, I used a sterile cotton pellet and just applied a little pressure there. And then I uh, mixed the MTA um, with, um, I like to mix MTA with, with my lidocaine, with my 2% uh, 1 in 100 lidocaine, because it also acts as a, as a hemostatic agent as well. And then I used an amal amalgam carrier and just, and just packed it right on top of that. And then I used a cotton pellet and cavit. And that, once I did that, I sent the patient back to his pediatric dentist for restoration. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Now, in terms of caries removal in cases like this, my experience has been it's really a, uh, it's important to use a really low torque um, protocol for removing the caries. When you want to do a caries control where you are expecting to do either an indirect or a direct pulp cap, I found that using high speed burrs with lots of water is really important. You know, traditionally we've been using a lot of this uh, low speed at a very low speed with these uh, burrs that we cut and dry. And I think that has kind of started to change so that we're understanding that having that low torque and heat that's generated by this by the slow speed without water is not going to be very helpful in terms of preserving the pulp if you're planning on on, on doing some kind of a um, uh, you know, either direct or indirect pulp cap. So uh, in this case, you did uh, restore the tooth uh, following uh, this uh, this procedure and the general dentist uh, put on a stainless steel crown, as I can see currently, correct? And this is a six-month right. recall. And can you describe what you see uh, in this case? Yep, um, we have a six-month recall and we can see there's a, a dentin bridge already forming under that uh, mesial aspect. Um, of that pulp there, and um, and we can see that we're getting some elongation of the roots and also some thickening of the dentin. So um, so so far, and the and the patient is completely asymptomatic. So so far, everything is going going very well. Yeah, it's a wonderful result for six months uh, follow-up. And then you also have a one-year recall in which you uh, are showing uh, almost complete root formation, and uh, that that's really wonderful. Right, and it's and it's important to um, get get these patients back. And I know it's tough to get recalls, especially on kids, because they're so busy. And you know, the parent usually say, "Oh well, they're not hurting." 
but we definitely want to get these to get these cases back, and I think uh, six months and one year recall is is paramount. Um, but ultimately, if you can get a two year recall, yeah, most you know. of the time you'll be able to see that apex completely closed, and then you can kind of you know rest assured that you know if this patient ever need endo down the road at at least um, you got the proper root length and you got some pretty nice and thick and dentin walls that you should have a successful outcome if you even have to do it down the road. Yeah, that's terrific. I think you're absolutely right. Follow-up in these cases is really important because uh, there's different philosophies. I think most people prefer to just kind of leave the tooth alone at this point if it's been preserved and, 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 and the pulp remains uh, vital and uh, static. In some cases, as people see that the tooth starts to calcify and become dystrophically calcified, I've seen some people decide that they do the endo before it becomes calcified fully and it becomes inoperable in case it becomes a problem. I think that's debatable, obviously. But I think you got wonderful results here with a two-year recall, and I'm sure you're going to follow up with this patient, which unfortunately it appears that uh, uh, he's having some uh, spacing issues too with that premolar coming out. Are there any plans to change the stainless steel crown at some point? Are they waiting for the, the occlusion to get stabilized first? Is that what's going on? Yeah, that's that's correct. They're, they, they're waiting for the occlusion to get stabilized, and, and, and he has all his um, permanent teeth in place. And then they're going to change that stainless steel crown out uh, to, to a nice uh, permanent crown. Perfect. Well... This was a wonderful case, and I think it was very educational for everyone. Uh, Dr. Rico Short, certified, board certified endodontist at Apex Endodontics, Atlanta, Georgia. Also clinical assistant professor at the Medical College of Georgia School of Dentistry. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. For those of you interested in sharing your clinical cases with our global audience in the format you just uh, watched, please contact me at the address below. For people that know, I'm Ali Nese, and I hope you found this information helpful.